Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So I'm Andy Cohen. I am the director of the HKUST Institute for Advanced Study, uh, the host for today's distinguished lecture. So I want to give everyone here a warm welcome, uh, especially those who are physically here at the IAS. It's nice to actually have uh, people in the audience uh, live, but also uh, a welcome to all those who are joining us online. So it is a special pleasure today to welcome Dr. Kai Fu Lee uh, to the IAS. I think this is your first visit here with us, uh, and we're very grateful uh, that you're willing to spend the afternoon with us today. Uh, I'm sure that Dr. Lee is no stranger to any of you. Uh, if I were to uh, give a proper introduction detailing his awards and accomplishments, we would have no time remaining for today's lecture. So I will be brief. Uh, suffice it to say that Dr. Lee is a well-known computer scientist, having made important contributions to machine learning and art, uh, artificial intelligence while at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, in 1990, he left Carnegie Mellon to move to the private sector, where over the ensuing uh, several decades, he has served as a senior executive in a who's who list of the most prominent innovation and technology companies throughout the world including Apple, SGI, Microsoft, and Google, uh, where he was instrumental in developing Google's presence in China, serving as president of Google China. Since 2009, the Dr. Lee has been the chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures, a venture capital firm focusing on developing the next generation of Chinese high-tech companies with, I think, something like uh, 3 billion US dollars under management. Uh, he simultaneously serves as president of Sinovation Ventures Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, in addition to his both scholarly and entrepreneurial pursuits, Dr. Lee is an accomplished writer, having uh, authored several books on AI and its impact on society. His 2017 book, AI Superpowers, anticipated China's rise as an AI superpower and provided a prescient look at the importance of AI and its influence that it has on society and geopolitical events. His latest book, AI 2041, further predicts that AI, along with other advanced technologies, including robotics, uh, industrial automation, semiconductor chip design, quantum computing, and a host of other uh, innovations, will usher in a new industrial revolution, uh, bringing about further transformation of modern society. So I think all of us here are witnesses to China's growing scientific prowess, its exceptional entrepreneurial ecosystem, its huge market, its burgeoning databases, all these achievements spurred by tremendous support from the Chinese government. And these developments give rise to the question that serves as the title of today's talk, at least it was the title on our posters. Uh, I think the New title is the answer to that question. The original question, will China become a deep tech superpower? Opportunities for deep tech entrepreneurship. So uh, like you, I'm excited to hear what Dr. Lee has to tell us. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here physically. And I'm apparently setting several records at the Hong Kong schools. Uh, by bringing students back from uh, watching video conference speeches to real life uh, uh, speaking events. So today I'm going to talk about how AI and other technologies uh, evolve into creating the most um, interesting and exciting era for all of you who are students to be alive in this amazing time. But before I go in, I want to set some basic ground on what AI is because it's a very large field in which machine learning is a subfield and deep learning is one key technology. But often uh, people com basically conflate these terms as will I in this talk. When I speak about AI, I will talk about narrow AI using deep learning and that family of uh, technologies. And as a result, it actually is a very different way than the way human intelligence works. Whereas a human intelligence is very good for analytic, analytical inferences, common sense, creativity, uh, learning from few examples, but imprecise. And AI, or actually machine learning more specifically, wants a lot of data, 
whenever you can get a huge amount of data within a single domain, AI will always outperform people, especially if they are quantitative tasks. And uh, that's the strength of AI. And what it's not good at is, of course, the, these things that I mentioned, as well as creativity and emotion and love and all those things. So uh, it actually, this type of AI is actually a great complement for our intelligence. It's not a complete replacement. It is very good for replacing the routine tasks that we do and can be used to really give us the opportunity to be liberated from having to do um, I guess a lot of questions are coming up um, from having to do routine tasks. So that said, uh, as uh, Andy introduced, I wrote this book in 2018, which is uh, all about China's rise and divides AI into four types of AI. And because, as I just described, AI is really about whether you can get a huge amount of data then, of course, it will begin with Internet AI, where there's the most data, followed by business AI, where big data in financial and other applications will drive new uses of AI, followed by perception, which actually is uh, vision and speech and language understanding, in which AI is making tremendous progress. But not only these are our human, among our human six senses, but uh, AI can have many more senses. As you know, smart sensors can start to uh, uh, perceive 3D shapes, even in relative darkness and humidity uh, and temperature. These are things people can't do. So it's almost like really having superpowers uh, that can integrate all kinds of sens sensory information that humans cannot do. So the third row is advancing very quickly not only beating people in image recognition and uh, speech recognition, but also ex being extended to many senses that we simply don't have. Finally, automation is about uh, having the ability to manipulate and move, so robotics, autonomous vehicles. And, and basically, these were my predictions of where US and China would be uh, next year. And I think we're more or less on track. Uh, and uh, to be more precise, I think, uh, other than uh, I think in business AI, China has not made that, that much inroads. It's, it's maybe a little more behind than I predicted four years ago. Uh, everything else appears to be more or less uh, on track. So the reason that China has done so well in AI, um, I see many Chinese faces here, is really all of you, that China has had a tremendous uh, improvement in its education system in engineering, and Chinese students jump into areas that are hot, right? If you go to any mainland China uh, Department of Computer Science, the chances are everyone's actually studying AI. So that creates an army of AI engineers. And everywhere I go, including Hong Kong, people complain to me about can't find any AI engineers, and there's actually a surplus of AI engineers in China. Uh, they were trained due to the hot, exciting area and the higher pay, and they are, they've, been, they've been experimenting with the world's largest databases, so now they are ready to engage and participate and create value. And many of you in the room qualify in that category, uh, but I think for Hong Kong's further growth, we really need more help from these uh, not only well-trained, but um, experienced AI engineers from China. And uh, China's internet uh, scene created uh, really large super apps that were very, very powerful until the recent regulations. Uh, certainly when I read, wrote the book, AI Superpowers, their monopolistic power were growing rapidly, creating super apps in which we spend pretty much all of our time. I, uh, and, and that accumulates a huge amount of data that can be used for uh, user insight as well as making money. Imagine if you're a business person with a dial that can dial up user minutes or, com or user conversion or monetization and revenue or even profit, uh, what kind of a tool that would be for a corporate uh, leadership team. And China's had a lot of uh, AI investment and very strong support from the government. These have led to China's rise in AI, and it was covered in my first book. 
So beyond the, uh, so within the, with the first book, uh, for me, it wasn't just writing a piece of fiction. Uh, actually, we put it into practice. So in anticipating the four waves growing rapidly in China, in particular waves one, three, and four, we put our investments in place, and we're proudly the investors in the following 10 unicorns. And we invested mostly in um, uh, Series A very early in these companies. So we've achieved a very high multiples, as much as a, a 100x on this page. Uh, actually, before the recent stock market problems, uh, even, even higher. Uh, but we have done very, very well applying what we believe in. So uh, if you want to uh, make a lot of money, read my books. <laughs> the answers are in there. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, when I gave a talk in AI Superpowers, someone in the audience said, tell me one stock I should buy. And at the time, I said NVIDIA. And had, the test, had, some, had that person bought NVIDIA, they'd be very well off, even with today's sell-off. So what, what holds for the future? I wrote another book last year, published at the end of the year, called AI 2041. It's an interesting book because it is a science fiction. It's like a black mirror, but more optimistic. So one could jokingly call it white mirror, if you will. 80% uh, of the stories end uh, positively, uh, but uh, it's different from black mirror in two ways. One is the optimism, and the other main difference is that it's all written with a pretty disciplined approach to technology prediction. So I created a technology map of what technology would look like in 20 years, uh, 10 to 20 years, let's say. And my partner, Stanley Chen, he wrote 10 stories that uh, used the roadmap I created. And after each story, I talk about the technologies, how they work, how they will grow, what are the problems, and how to solve them. So that's the, the book, the stories. But today, I'm not going to tell you stories. That's, that's Stanley's strength, not mine. What I will be talking about is uh, some of the great technologies that, um, that are in, in the book. The book actually contains about 20 different technologies. Uh, I've chosen five most prominent ones, but there are many others, such as metaverse. Uh, some of you might say Web3 or uh, blockchain, and, and obviously many, many other technologies. Uh, but, but today, we, we talk only about these five. And, and I think this is where those of you, I think most of you are in technology and innovation. Uh, it's really an amazing time. There's no other time in human history when there was a confluence of five amazing technologies that will completely change the future of society and the economy and jobs and the industries. So to give you a frame of comparison, the closest one was about 120 years ago, when three amazing inventions changed the next 120 years. And those three were electricity, uh, electromagnetic wave, and combustible engine. Of course, you might say, OK, yeah, so a combustible engine created Ford, and um, electricity created General Electric, and uh, electromagnetic wave created uh, RCA, or AT&T, whatever your favorite uh, communication company is. And that's, the big, that's a big deal. That really is nothing. What really happened was the intertwining of these technologies changed everything we knew. It took a long time to create back then, because to get to an electrical grid, it was not something that could happen in 10 or 20 years. But ultimately, they really changed everything. Think about the impact of electricity, for example. But also think about how they connect with each other. Uh, the combination of electricity and electromagnetic wave uh, basically built a foundation that allowed uh, radio, which allowed the uh, uh, possibility of wireless transmission and uh, codes. And that caused the encryption that happened during the World War. And that led to Alan Turing creating the Enigma computer, which was the father of modern computing, and on which communications, the PC, 
mobile internet, smartphones all developed on top of that. So it really is cross-industry changing, and it created new industries like semiconductor chips that didn't exist before. So that, those years were really the best years. And the country that benefited the most from those three in, inventions was the United States. Even though some inventions were, were made by Americans, others by Europeans, but the country that wins is the one that industrializes, commercializes, and creates value, and that was the US. So the same opportunity now is, is here, but even, even bigger. Some of you might say, these five things, are they really as big as electricity? So let me quickly <laughs> go through them. One, two, three, four, five. Artificial intelligence, something that can beat us in basically everything we do within a single domain, as long as it's quantifiable and it has data. Automation will replace 50% of human jobs, including blue collar and white collar. Quantum computing will solve tasks that are unsolvable today on our classical computers and be trillions of times faster. Life sciences will allow us to play God and create life and edit life. And new energy will dramatically reduce the cost of energy by 90% in the next 10 to 20 years. When you combine all of these together, any one of them is as big as electricity. How can you not agree with that? And furthermore, when we have the combination of synthetic biology in life sciences, that will create new materials, one molecule at a time, as opposed to using toxic chemicals like um, uh, fossil fuel as a basis of our materials. We not only get green materials, but we get to use not scarce, but infinite resources because we're creating the materials, one molecule at a time, that are much cheaper and cleaner. And, and also automation is something that will dramatically reduce the cost of production because labor is re replaced by robots. Each of this, the material, if you think about the cost of goods, the cost of anything, this table, uh, this jacket, or this phone, uh, the cost will go down dramatically because the material cost goes way down. That's one big part of the cost. The labor goes way down because it'll be done by robotics. And finally, the energy will be way down perhaps by 90%. That will make everything we have in the world today much, much lower cost and hopefully much, much lower price, thereby creating a society of plenitude where people no longer have to suffer under poverty and hunger. So these are the combinations of in the next 10 to 20 years what we have to look forward to. And that's the future opportunity that awaits all of you as you graduate and think about what you can do and the contribution that you might make to society. So let's quickly go over each one of the five to tell you what I think is exciting right now. So let's bring life back to um, 2022 and talk about what's exciting now, what will be exciting in the next 10 years, and uh, why I'm so excited about these five things. And then finally, I'll conclude with how we at Sanovation chose, chose to invest in these key technology areas. So first is AI. And I'll basically draw your attention to the previously biggest breakthrough in the last 10 years. One could argue beyond deep learning. It was probably convolution neural networks. And that made uh, computer vision, something that works incredibly well. Back in 2011, 2012, that was Jeff Hinton's students publishing the AlexNet paper, upon which the quality of image recognition, object recognition jumped. And the blue bar shows how fast they jumped, and then the red line shows human per performance. You can see that by 2015, with the boost of DNN and CNN, uh, AI image recognition beat people. And that was actually when Sinovation read the papers. We are one of the VCs that actually read academic papers and saw the power of CNN. And we made investments in the fundamental technology, but also in the potential application areas. 
So we saw that obviously facial recognition would be an application area, but also uh, visual inspection in manufacturing, uh, in reading of uh, radiology compared to human radiologists, uh, robotics should improve a lot from SLAM to being with vision. And then finally, autonomous vehicles can now see with all these cameras. So we made investments on the upper right-hand side companies that have done incredibly well based on one observation, which is that computer vision will outdo people. And when that happens, it will replace and be symbiotic with people, creating tremendous value. It's pretty straightforward, actually, but that was the big thing. So more recently, something big happens again, which is a natural language. Um, I think more, more commonly people call it LLM, large language models, started with uh, Google's Transformer and BERT and the GPT-3, and that sequence of technologies, Google Lambda and many others, that we can call foundation model or LLM. The, the name isn't important, but the concept is that if you train a gigantic model on the whole world's data, that can be fine-tuned to any application and do amazing things. But it can also be tested on a generic application, uh, namely reading comprehension, the Stan Stanford test. And you see the same blue cur uh, charts going up and one could probably predict in 2018 this, this was going to beat human capability. For those of you not in AI, today you can make an AI algorithm, feed a book to it, and then ask any questions and get answers that are equal or more accurate than most people can answer. So now it's become really good. Uh, people will worry, worry this true uh, is it sen sentient or true understanding? It's not. It's still very smart pattern matching, but it does, if you look at just the empirical answers, they're very accurate. So it was not hard to predict back in 2018, it's time to make investments in natural language. So we've made a number of investments, and when the language model improves at this level of magnitude, speech recognition will work much, much better. Uh, so you've seen captioning from talks like this with lots of errors. Those errors will go down in the next five years. Machine translation is usable for fun, but not really good for serious work. But in five years, that will change. When you travel to another country, you'll be able to have an earpiece that will translate for you nearly in real time. Search engines will graduate to really reach Larry Page's vision. When I joined Google, Larry Page said, what we have is temporary. A bunch of words entered in a box leading to a bunch of websites you can click on, that's temporary. The ultimate search engine has to be one where you ask any question and get one answer back. And we're all well on the way to building that. Any of you who doubt it, try ask Google in English a question, any question. You won't always get the right answers, but you will be surprised how many it attempts to answer and what percentage actually is very accurate or at least gives you great insight. So clearly Google is ahead, ahead in this overall technology and is already embedding it in their search engine. I, I think in the next five years, we should expect search engines that do question answering as the primary method of interaction, fitting the conversational metaphor that we should have, whether it's with metaverse or with uh, mobile phones. Typing a bunch of words just isn't going to be the most um, advanced way of interaction. <clears throat> and then the scary application is targeted advertising. Imagine if you, you've all heard of Cambridge Analytica. It was targeting groups of individuals using targeted advertising to convince them to vote for a certain candidate or a party. That same technology uh, is now on steroids because now you can target not to one group of people, but to every single individual. So let's say you want to sell a Tesla, and then there are five people, different people. Maybe one is an Elon Musk fan, another loves green energy, another wants fast cars, another wants fancy electronics and a big pad, and others want doors that open in a very cool way. And Tesla would be sold in very different ways to each of them. 
Imagine again for something that is the consumer doesn't really understand, uh, such as what stocks to buy. But knowing what kind of investment philosophy you have, that's the right way to sell to you. That's how stockbrokers back 40 years worked. And if you imagine something that, other than the super high brands, they're all basically the same, then the ones that succeed are the ones that are marketed well. Let's say cosmetics, right? Maybe one person wants a Japanese look, another wants a very tanned, healthy look. That cosmetic can be targeted to be sold to each person based on what the person will get convinced by. So if you're a TikTok, or, oh sorry, you don't have TikTok in Hong Kong. If you're a Douyin user, let's say, um, and uh, you're addicted to watching a lot of Douyin, because it's very good at targeting pre-recorded short form video to you in a way that you would like. But now imagine if you are not any longer taking an inventory of videos, but you're synthesizing a video from scratch in a way that the person likes. Imagine how much powerful that can be. Um, so you've all seen Doll E, I'm sure, that creates a very nice image from words, but that can easily, in the next five years, be extended into videos. So in the future, these targeted, customized videos, image, and words, on the one hand, will become incredibly lucrative opportunity that are worth more than the entire advertising industry today. Beyond that will be content creation industry. It's going to be huge but it comes with all the dangers and worries and externalities that they'll be used for bad purposes. But here we're just talking technology. So you see the excitement and the opportunities and the investments one could make to bring these applications to, to real life. So that's the, so that, that's hopefully this slide will show you the number one, AI is still advancing state of the art very rapidly. Number two, by reading academic papers, you can find new opportunities and maybe make a lot of money or create exciting companies. And, uh, and, and number three, uh, some of these changes are going to create tremendous opportunities, but very big danger. These are the walkaways, I think, from here. And this is just another slide talking about the large language models, what kinds of things they can make. Um, and then coming, bringing back to the topic, where will China be in this global competition for large language models? Well, mostly you see Western names, uh, Google, Facebook, or Meta AI, and uh, OpenAI being the originator of the large language models. But what happens, again, is that typical American research firms compete on how big and large and fancy the demos are. It's the Chinese companies that make them real. That's exactly what happened with all the previous things, speech recognition, facial recognition, now large language models. If you think about the large language models, obviously they're very powerful. You train on a giant, huge amount of data. You have a big model. Then you tune it for specific tasks. But what is the problem of commercializing that product? Three big problems. Number one. The models are way too large for real deployment. You can't commercially make it viable. Secondly, it generates nonsense. You've all seen the GPT-3 nonsense, right? Uh, I had GPT-3 uh, tell, make a biography of myself, make a uh, Wikipedia, write a Wikipedia page for Kai Fu Lee. And it proceeds to write two thirds fact and then uh, maybe 20% 20, 20 uh, questionable stuff and 15, 13% total nonsense, right? It says I graduated from MIT. It made up names for my kids and says I work on computer vision. But it got most of the gist correctly. But that kind of fake news and false content will not pass muster as a real product. How do you prevent fake wrong content and apply post-processing? It's also very, very biased. If you, if you go to GPT-3 and you type the man, let it complete the sentence, then try the woman. If you try the Christian, followed by the uh, Muslim, and you will see the striking bias that it has because it learned from all the data on the internet. So you got to solve that problem. 
Then the third problem is, well, it's the applications that make money. What use is a giant model you can do demos with? So the fine-tuning algorithm needs to become like an API so that you can take the giant model, make it smaller, and then apply some additional in-domain model and make, make to work a specific app that actually it does machine translation, question answering, targeted advertising, and so on. So that is where the Chinese entrepreneurship comes into play. Uh, we've uh, incubated and invested in the company called Langboat, and uh, it has risen to number one in the Chinese um, competition uh, uh, called Clue, which is the Chinese NLP competition. It's very academic, not necessarily totally reflecting everything, but we got number one. Furthermore, we made a much smaller model, about 0.1% the size, solving the first problem. And we've uh, licensed to several big name companies of uh, building applications, creating fine tuning engines and APIs that could make this a new platform. If you're interested, the website is available. This company was made in one and a half years. It, it has zero code one and a half years ago. So for those of you in AI, this is the kind of company you can aspire to build from nothing to number one, from zero dollars to several big licensees, uh, from uh, great research to real working code that people will pay money for. So, so I think entrepreneurship in AI is alive and well in China, and we'll continue to see exciting companies uh, from China that do that. Moving to the second area, um, industrial automation. There are two angles. One is how will autonomous vehicle become a reality? There's the Waymo approach, which is very Silicon Valley-esque. It is solve the hardest problem, namely L5, then everything else will follow a very admirable, typical, respectable, grand vision, uh, grand challenge type of approach. Um, and, and, and that's what Waymo took. But I think in China, such an approach is, would be seriously problematic. First, I think Chinese at most advanced research is still behind the US. I don't think we dare build an L5 without anything, without anything before. Um, secondly, it's just not a Chinese way to do things. We are much more incremental, building on top of success, accumulating data, as I described in AI superpowers. And thirdly, we don't have Alphabet's war chest to fund a giant company like Waymo. So the approach that we took as innovation was every autonomous vehicle company we invested in must have a real paying customer at some point after founding, let's say two years. And that paying customer should have a constrained scenario in which today's autonomous vehicle technologies work without creating something brand new. After all, entrepreneurship is about building valuable products that people will pay for, not about creating something that's new that no one has done before. That task is for academia, for people, for the professors in this audience. If you are founding a company, taking investors' money, you got to find real solutions. So some of the Chinese companies, the ones that we invested in, were heavily pressured to find that customer. And the good news is we now have five autonomous vehicle companies uh, under our investment that have developed a uh, autonomous forklift that works indoors. Of course, it works very well. Very simple problem within aisles. You don't even have roads. And, they're, and also, they're clear of people. We have autonomous uh, airport logistics actually deployed right here, you see, is in Hong Kong. Hong Kong Airport uses this company's technologies for autonomous transport. One step harder, now it's outside, but still in an in a airport, relatively um, very, very structured environment. Third is a trucking uh, solution for autonomous vehicle that is applied, uh, that's used at ports to move between point A and point B only, and large, heavy cargo. Because we observe the, the, the workload everywhere for, for drivers and vehicles. One of the most routine, repetitive, boring workloads are at the port, where they only go from A, B, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So nailing one route is certainly not very difficult. Then more advanced would, of course, be trucks on highways 
which is a lot more structured and easier and less variable, um, no cross traffic, et cetera, compared to in-city driving. So we are trying to do that one. And then we have many more advanced than that would be robo-buses. Robo-buses are different from L5 vehicles in that they don't have to go from any place A to B, but they just need to make 20 stops. And so it's very, very predictable. They don't have to go um, out of um, any route, so it's much easier. And we have that deployed in seven cities in China, 200 vehicles now, thousands by next year. Uh, and also another one not shown is for street cleaning, a very slow vehicle that goes out at night, but you can go slowly, you can put on lots of light, you can even make the body of the vehicle soft material. So God forbid if you hit somebody, it's not going to be lethal. And then lastly is a, a company that built uh, aftermarket L1, L2 products uh, and uses it to gather data for training L3, L4 products. Maybe not a proven proposition. Uh, can you be endowed with an insufficient sensor and still create a basis on which more advanced sensors can, can be fine-tuned? Uh, well, Tesla is trying that, so are we. So these five companies uh, have, are doing extremely well. They're generating 10 to $150 million of revenue per year. And uh, people really didn't care and didn't notice, and even people, even Chinese startups are saying, why do you have to get revenue? It's more important to have more PhDs, more demos, and more power and getting closer to L5, and let's, let's see who can compete on uh, having a larger fleet of robo-taxis, and we don't need any revenue. Uh, they thought so because back then, U.S. IPO was an option. And in, in the U.S., for some reason, Wall Street didn't care about revenue. Well, in Hong Kong and mainland China, we do. So with the moment U.S. listings became problematic was the moment that these companies became front runners in going public in either mainland China or in Hong Kong. So they're doing extremely well. And it reminds us again, the type of company you build should be consistent with the ecosystem and the financial market in the region that you build it. The lower part has to do with uh, industrial automation. Uh, that is a huge area, one area China is destined to win and must win because China is the world's factory. And we know for a fact that Vietnam workers are paid one half of Chinese workers. So China can never compete with Vietnam based on cost alone. Uh, if not cost alone, then it has to be automation. And that automation is heavily supported by the government. Uh, and also at Sinovation, we could create a roadmap of all the workloads that could be in an industrial workplace and work on one that are, ones that are practical today, tomorrow, year after, the year after. You can plot the various workloads from easy to hard, from eyesight to movement to muscle to hand-eye coordination and, and so on, and solve these problems in order, creating value, um, hopefully um, helping the, the country's economy. Here are some examples of the various um, robots that we've invested in. On the upper right are these tiny little light cards that are quite inexpensive and very nimble. They work in swarms and they know each other's location. They never hit each other. The only caveat is no human ever enter the warehouse because that creates an element of unpredictability and danger. You can see the only human is the one putting the, car the boxes, the crates on the carts. And I'm sure within the next year or so, the human will be replaced there as well. On the lower right, you see one of our favorite activities, PCR tests. Not one machine, but robots. This is actually an assembly line size robot that can do 120,000 nucleic acid tests per day. That's how some of China's cities are able to process so many, so fast, so predictably. Um, and um, you can see from the lower right of this picture how fast these robotics arms are moving. Much, much, much faster than human ability to move, especially when you have toxic or dangerous or contaminant materials. So these robots will have no contamination, no errors, move very fast, work 24 by 7, and basically create, um, replace people in much higher accuracy and predictability. 
on the lower right is not an AI breakthrough, but a materials breakthrough. Uh, these professors in a Chinese university came up with a material for the, for the fingers of this uh, grasp grabber that it can grab an egg yolk from an egg without damaging it. So we can anticipate over time this can become the picker in, say, an e-commerce warehouse. If you're wondering, when you buy from, say, JD or, or Amazon, uh, who's packing your box for you? It's actually a human that's packing the box. There is a robot called Kiva in Amazon. So if you buy, let's say, uh, 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 my book, let's say, and, and an iPhone or uh, order from Amazon and you get a box with my book and iPhone next to it, what actually happened was the Kiva robot would move a shelf of my books in front of the human picker. The human picker would grab it, put it in the box. The shelf would go away, another box of iPhones will come. That person will pick and put in the box, and then the box gets automatically packed up and shipped to you. Mostly automatic, but the part of picking was not doable, partly because the steel fingers can break things that are, are fragile. So with this technology, probably the picker job can also be replaced. And each of this is millions of jobs. So the implication to the job market is uh, unquestionably an issue we have to solve. Uh, third is uh, quantum. But um, before I go into quantum, I know everyone's thinking about the, in, uh, whether, whether semiconductor is investable. Uh, the answer is yes, but it has to be with a caveat. We have made many investments in semiconductor chip companies, about a dozen altogether. Uh, but they're all fabulous design. They don't necessarily directly go into the difficult problem um, of, of uh, the, 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 the fabrication or the foundry or the, the EDA software. Those are some of the challenges that all chips will face, and hopefully China will find a way to overcome. But we don't really see that as uh, something we as a private investor can get into. We go into chip design which is probably the more intellectually creative and challenging problem. And we need to help the entrepreneurs who are very good at um, building generations of chips from companies they've worked in before. And then we need to help them figure out what are some generational um, changes happening. For example, servers have got to be moving from x86 to ARM. That's inevitable because the clients are moving from x86-based PCs to ARM-based phones and hopefully also PCs. So as these things happen, uh, the generational changes will happen, and we don't have to be a zero-sum game, but rather go after new markets. And then we want to, and a lot of large Chinese companies are nervous about using American chips in case there was a, is a cutoff coming up. So we want to find a big Chinese customer to, to be the a trial case, um, uh, proof of concept in, at first, and then proof of capability, and then a big customer. And then lastly, we will find what are the areas the Chinese government cares a lot, in which case they might have some kind of subsidy that will help us reduce the cost of investment. So these are the things we do on our uh, chip design companies that we fund. Um, but coming back to AI, what's very interesting is this chart, which I borrowed from the website of OpenAI. This shows the most advanced AI demonstration over the years, from 1960 to date. What you'll see is that all the demos up to 2010 were pretty much writing on Moore's Law. What that really means was AI was unimportant back then, so whatever Moore's Law gave us, we would use. Uh, we wouldn't try to use something super expensive because researchers can't afford supercomputers. But AI became really exciting in the uh, you know, 2015 or so since AlphaGo. And since 2010, for large companies, they've been using them. Uh, they've been using more and more machines. And the best AI demonstrations are very hungry for power, simply because, as I mentioned earlier, um, more data, the better the performance. When we go towards nearly infinite data, well, of course, we'll need a lot of computing to, to train on that much data. So more in the last 10 years, AI, advanced AI applications have required seven times 
the year before, uh, how much compute power was being used by the most advanced um, demos at that time. So, so the Y chart is a log chart where each step in this, in this, um, in this chart is 10 times more power. So you can see several things. One is that if AI is going to be as important as I predict and many of us think, then it will require so much compute that it's not doable today. That's why investment in semiconductor and in quantum are critically important. Um, uh, and, and secondly, it also presents a problem. If this continues to grow, giant companies will have so much more resources than startups that we fund and you at universities. So something needs to get done. Um, so what is the ultimate solution? Well, clearly in the longer term, well, first, if we break it down, actually to be more precise, the 1.5x is alive and well, but it's not the traditional CPU Moore's law. Um, you probably know that the CPU has stopped growing at 1.5x for some time. It's more like 1.1x. But GPU has been very good in boosting, and many of you probably think that's fantastic. It's a super accelerator. But really, all you get is 1.5x when we need 7x. And, and in exponentiated year after year, it's a huge difference. We're going to be really lagging. If all you have is a desktop computer with a, with a GPU, then basically you're going to be you're going to be here when you need to be here. And this is, again, a logarithmic scale. So this is really, really a problem. So what are some possible solutions? Well, clearly one is the advent of the quantum computer, which unfortunately is still at least a decade away. And what do we do until then? Well, that's why people have come up with TPU and IPU and quantum-inspired computing, and I'm very hopeful that one of them will work. And also, it, it also points out the importance of the kind of work that Langboat does, which is can we reduce the, um, the size and the compute so that we can keep AI, at most advanced AI models that perform at the state of the art, but at a reduced um, computation requirement. The companies that can do that will have a definite edge over the others. But coming back to quantum, which is the next topic, clearly this is um, the biggest competition. Uh, Forbes has said this is going to be the true area where large countries are going to fight it out for supremacy because it changes the rule of the game. Uh, for example, um, uh, encryption, uh, RSA encryption will stop working. So those of you who have, who have old style Bitcoin wallets, well, someone's gonna steal it from you uh, when they have a quantum computer. But quantum will not only bring the weapon for the bad guys, quantum-based encryption will also be unbreakable even if the bad guys have a quantum computer. And also quantum will require every algorithm to be changed. So imagine if you go into a hardware or software in 10 years when quantum computers come out, uh, everything needs to be rewritten. So there's definitely a future for software engineering for quantum plus X, where X could be uh, every, any kind of algorithm, and they can all be potentially patented. So huge opportunities there. Um, and, and quantum, of course, can be used to train AI in ways that have can't, not imaginable today uh, because it can simultaneously keep many, many things in, 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 in variability. And it can also be used to model anything based on physical quantum mechanics, whether it's the human body or the, or the global climate change. Um, and also, once quantum computer, we start, we start to figure out how it works. Um, they work with qubits, not bits. So every time you add a qubit, the, com the computer becomes twice as large. So if we need seven times more compute from one year to the other, you just need to add three qubits, and then that's eight times more power, then we're done. So we're very hopeful that quantum will be not only a way to address the underperforming compute powers today, but also open to many, many new kinds of computing. And, um, and I think it's the one technology that I would safely predict to be more important than AI, assuming we could get it to work. Um, but it's also a giant piece of engineering. So it's not so much publish a bunch of papers and then someone else can make a product, which is more or less the way AI is. 
quantum is a giant piece of technology. So it really tests the power of giant corporations like Google and IBM and tests the will of large countries like US and China. So how does China, where does China stand? I think you can definitely see the Chinese government recognizes the importance, puts in more money, files more patents, and is trying to catch up on the number of qubits. But the reality of the situation really is US is still way ahead. Um, the, the, the substance of the demonstrations, the quality of the products at Google and others, I think still puts US ahead. But there is definitely a chance that China will catch up. And certainly China appears to be well poised to be number two even at present. Let's switch gears a bit to life science. Now, life science is a big area. We talked about synthetic biology, but let's focus on healthcare for a moment. Because if all these technologies are gonna see all these breakthroughs, can we live longer and, and uh, healthier? Uh, many things are happening. The number one is that everything's becoming digital in healthcare. So uh, our hospital records, our radiology records, our genetic sequencing, and our wearable computing is creating a giant database for each of us that doctors, human doctors, can never comprehend. So the opportunity to do precision medicine targeted for each person, just as we talked about TikTok, knowing what video to show you, everyone wants to see different videos and everyone has different body and different conditions and family history and probably needs different treatment and can benefit from variable treatments. So that's a huge opportunity to, 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 do, to do once we have the amount of data. Uh, there are also infinite number of you know, many, many new medicines that are invented. No doctor can possibly track all that. So diagnostics based on this huge database per person is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, secondly is the advances in um, the, the fundamental sciences in the biology and, and um, healthcare. Uh, we are at a point when new technologies are really coming out and they will have new ways of doing metrics, both new measures and new ways of doing old measures. For example, if you might remember 20 years ago, your blood test was still a human technician looking under a microscope counting the white blood cells. But now we just do a PCR, it's all done automatically. Such advances combined with um, data technologies are making it possible to create new medical instruments that are at the same time cheaper, faster, more accurate, um, and, and smaller. And, and that just never happens. If you look at Apple products, right? Sometimes it's um, you know, uh, the same but cheaper. Sometimes it's, more, uh, it's faster but more expensive. You get one or two of the four. Uh, but never three and certainly never four. But now we have things that are all four. And China has the advantage of having uh, Shenzhen manufacturing and a large population of people who are used to paying less for medical care. So that causes the price point to be pushed way down in products that are not inferior to the Western products. So Chinese brands should have a great future in advanced medical devices. So we're big believers in that area. And thirdly, if you count the number of academic papers, we know in AI, China has long surpassed US in numbers of papers, even in top 50% papers, even in top 10% papers, not quite in top 1%. But the same phenomenon, same is happening in the most advanced areas of um, bioinformatics, uh, genetic sequencing, immunotherapy, et cetera. Uh, Chinese researchers and the students kind of jump into these new exciting areas and make tremendous progress. Uh, and I think that will bode well for Chinese entrepreneurs in these areas. Uh, some of the companies we fund that are very exciting on the left-hand side is the next generation of that PCR robot. This is no longer a PCR robot. It's a robot that can do arbitrary wet lab experiments. Because if you think about What's manufacturing job that can be taken over by a machine? You're probably thinking, can we make an iPhone with a robot? That's actually very difficult because iPhones have very tiny parts that change a lot and requires dexterity, hand-eye coordination, and so on. But the job of a medical technician in a wet lab is heavily, highly replaceable. And imagine this giant bus-like 
uh, product is actually a, a wet lab custom design for a drug discovery company in China. And that company, in that company, the scientist no longer goes in and do the experiments. Because if you remember, when you were taking biology classes back or chemistry classes back in high school, the atomic actions that you perform are very limited. You pick up a test tube, pour things in, test the results, move it aside, pick another one, uh, screw the top on, and, and, and make sure there's no spillage. And, and, and that, that's the pretty much 70% of all the things you do in the lab. So robot can do it more predictably, more precisely, without contamination. So the benefit of such an automated wet lab is not just the cost of replacing the technician, but rather the three to 10 times speed up in getting results. The 24 by seven, the faster motor movements, the predictability, the, 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 the removal of errors. And it can do all kinds of wonderful things in, uh, for example, in uh, Monoclonal process is um, it's all eight times faster than, than humans. Here you see in the, in the lower left side an organoid that's created by the robot. Essentially, it's taking a drop of, your, of one's uh, stem cell and creating a heart organoid from it that can be used for experimentation. And the process of growing that heart is intricate taking care of the organ as though it were a baby. And, the, and the, the robot can actually do that much better than technicians. So these advances are happening. And AI for science is one of the greatest areas where we see uh, being poised for this kind of growth. On the right hand side is a Hong Kong based company called In Silico Medicine that has come up with new hypothetical drugs that are being, 20 of which are being in the process of the pipeline. Two of the 20 are now under clinical trials for pulmonary fibrosis and kidney fibrosis using basically uh, using um, small molecule uh, this, this drug discovery. We're also funding another company that is doing a large molecule uh, drug discovery, a much more complex process where the protein to protein interaction causes the disease. And we try to look for large molecule peptoid uh, peptide uh, treatment that could undo the interaction. And that requires a large amount of high volume data generation, and it can potentially lead to many more drugs being invented because humans have already covered most of the uh, single, mo single molecule drugs, and there are fewer opportunities for AI, but large molecule, there's still many opportunities. These are areas where we think the Chinese combination of great engineering, what you'll see in the last, what you saw in the last few examples is that while US is ahead in fundamental sciences, China is better in building engineering that just works. So the giant wet lab robot, these types of uh, generation of data for AI, the combination of large data and AI is great for China. The last of the five is sustainable technologies. We know that with uh, synthetic biology, we can, we can uh, come up with many, many applications, one of which I mentioned is creating new materials that are much cheaper to do, one molecule at a time. Um, another is creating new life, for example, making a worm that also is actually a fertilizer. So these become possible and open up many, many possibilities. But one interesting thing is applied to new energy. Uh, we saw the speed at which the energy prices dropped. So today, we're fortunate to actually enjoy green energy for many scenarios. Not all scenarios because of distribution problems, but in many scenarios, uh, solar plus storage in a battery is a cheaper way to, to generate energy and power. So that will further improve by 90% in cost reduction in the next 15 years or so. And by that time, it will, during, during this transformation, one of the great things that will happen to China's favor is that the country that is most powerful in energy is not one that's endowed with natural resources, fossil fuel, oil, natural gas, etc. But the most powerful country will be one because the cheapest form of energy, the most pre prevalent form of energy, will be solar panel and batteries. They might be a different solar panel, 
uh, they might be a different type of battery, maybe it's, it's hydrogen or some other power, but that combination, whoever, whatever country can make, can manufacture the best solar panels and batteries will win. And China is already five of the 10, uh, has already five of the top 10 battery companies and eight of the top 10 solar panel companies. So this race is China's to lose. An example of a very powerful um, battery company is CATL, Ningde Shidai. This is a very low profile company, but it's possibly going to be the most valuable tech company in China in the next few years. They have not only the largest share of the battery market, but they have advanced technologies. An example of that is a cell to chassis innovation, which makes the chassis of a car into a battery or vice versa. That dramatically reduces the part and the weight and allows for one charge to let the car go for a thousand kilometers and reducing the cost of a car. So that essentially will be a new reference design for an automobile. To me, that is a similar step to when Intel came up with the motherboard and essentially eliminated companies like Compaq. That PC companies would, eat, would, would have to hollow out their tech business and become a shell maker for the Intel motherboards back when Intel did that. And if this were to work, the same thing will, the same dilemma, Catch-22, will face car companies. Do you embrace another company's platform and just build a shell? Or do you compete? And can you compete? And the car company's competency is not building the battery, but other parts. So those are, that remains to be seen if it's that powerful. But I think it shows the promise that China may well be ahead in the area. So to conclude on these five things, I think AI remains a neck-to-neck -neck race, although US and China each has different strengths. Um, semiconductor US is clearly in a good position with the foundry uh, advantage, but China is advancing in design. Quantum, China is catching up, the US is ahead. Life sciences, US is ahead, and China is catching up in specific areas. And new energy, China is actually ahead. So China is doing pretty well right now, but well poised and working hard to catch up. So lastly, let me talk about uh, something, a big transformation happened in my firm. In the last 12 months, we also decided we would focus exclusively on the opportunities described here. Just like um, AI superpowers became a playbook for our investment, AI 2041 is now our playbook for our investment. We are a very deep tech focused uh, company. We have 15 PhDs that understand the technologies. It's important to note that in investing in internet apps is very, very different than investing in deep tech. Investing in internet apps, you just pick a good area that will grow exponentially, find an entrepreneur who is tenacious, give him or her so much money that they build a monopoly, and then they Beat all, the, uh, beat all the other companies, enjoy a monopoly, and then they laugh all the way to the bank until the regulation happens. But, but hopefully by then you will have sold your stocks. So that's the model that many VCs uh, did extremely well. Uh, but investing in deep tech companies isn't like that. You can't go to a drug discovery company, give them 10 times more cash, and say, kill all the competition and become a monopoly. That isn't going to happen. Instead, you need to understand the technology and match it with business value and form a company that has the right kind of talent. You need the scientists who understand that it's not just about science, but about engineering excellence, about building a product market fit, about how to market and find the right channels and how to make money. And you need to understand that most deep tech companies are B2B. And in a B2B company, the CEO is the top salesperson. So that scientist is essentially giving up his or her career in science because you have to, um, survival is most important and you have to wine and dine the customers and, and, and many of them might yield one sales lead. So it's a very, very different story. So what we try to do at Sinovation is we actually uh, have understanding of the deep tech and we also have business experience and we're building a new playbook different from the one that's proven to work by, by VCs here. And then we will help the scientists find a complementary team and explain how to 
developed industry exploration, market development, prototyping, product, and then taking it to market. And in the process, usually convincing the scientists, you know, stay in the university, let your students come out, you can be a chief scientist. We need to find people who are better at operating. There are occasionally a great researcher who becomes a CEO, but that's the exception, not the rule. And that's the approach we're taking to each one of these uh, areas. Of course, it differs slightly area to area. In, in the pharma, there are more PhD CEOs. In AI, there used to be, but there won't be. And then in semiconductor, maybe not. So, but it's case to that, but this general idea is that a different playbook is needed. You need to win the trust of the scientists and then uh, work alongside with them to build the right company poised for success. The dangers are significant and uh, work is also very, very heavy, much heavier than an internet startup. So these are the various things we do. We read the academic papers, we try to tap top talent, we have our headhunting CEOs, and then we have our internal tools that finds out what's a hot technology area, who's good at it, who in San Innovation Vote knows them. So we, we develop based on that. So we're finally finding a phase in time where our strong inclinations of a deep tech is now met with an environment and entrepreneurs who are very good in this particular space. So these are the areas we invest in. These are some of the companies we invest in. Uh, we also have an AI institute with a lot of people who are um, very, very capable and talented, and we incubate our own companies. So, so in conclusion, this is really the best of times for deep tech entrepreneurship, and that Sanovation uh, is, is very excited about entering this era of deep tech entrepreneurship. And we're also working on plans of extending to, to Hong Kong uh, our coverage. We should have a team based here by the end of the year. And we look forward to working with all of you to, find, to really find that amazing technology and talent that can build technologies that will change the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, so for the remainder of our time, uh, we're going to just have a discussion between Kai Fu and uh, uh, a couple of members of the HKST community. So let me invite you to come up uh, to the table. So in addition to Kai Fu, we have uh, Professor Pascal Fung, uh, Chair Professor in ECE and Director of the HKUST Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and uh, Professor Tim Zhang, who is a chair professor in EC and CSE and is currently serving as the university's vice president for research and development. So I'll just hand it over to Pascal, who will uh, be moderating and Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And uh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's such an honor, pleasure to have Kaifu here again. I think we had a CARE webinar last year where we had an online discussion. And for me, this is the first time in this room, I don't know, since uh, two years ago. So it's all very exciting. And uh, um, I will have some questions for Kaifu and some uh, for Tim. So to start with, Kaifu, I'm very, very um, excited to share your techno optimism on AI. And uh, it's what a, what a breath of fresh air from talking about risks and so on uh, where we encounter uh, around the world. However, today I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Um, so you have listed a number of very exciting opportunities to, uh, for entrepreneurship in AI and in other areas. And um, um, I think the, perhaps uh, I would like to actually ask you questions about the risk. Because for investment, obviously, you have to assess the risk as well. So uh, apart from what we traditionally think of risk, such as the funding situation and so on, we increasingly see the risk of regulation, mm -hmm. right? So for example, recently we have seen the regulation of internet companies. We have also seen uh, a regulation uh, overseas on data privacy and uh, other more stringent reg regulation leading to big tech companies in the US completely canceling the offering of, say, facial recognition. Now, um, in China recently, um, Chinese government even mandated the, uh, um, any companies with a recommendation engine 
must allow users to turn that off. So there, there will be more and more regulations. So how do you, first of all, as an investor, how do you assess such risk? And how do you advise our potential entrepreneurs to uh, assess and address such future okay. risks? Sure, thank you, Pascal. Well, I, I think the risks are going to uh, increase over time. I talked about some technologies like targeted advertising that will bring risks that we've never seen before. So I think uh, concern, awareness is absolutely essential, uh, not only of the users, and I think entrepreneurs and VCs alike should not be starry-eyed and just we can make money and hand wave the problems away and IPO and get rich and don't worry about it later. It's something that needs to be thought of up front. Um, I think every AI engineer and entrepreneur should be a responsible person who is almost like a medical uh, student who swears the Hippocrates oath. Uh, the Hippocrates oath is to harm no humans, but I think the AI is to be aware of the externalities and uh, be thoughtful in building systems that don't have problems and be committed to testing them so the problems are gone. So I think that's one part that's very important. Uh, that said, I am still optimistic that many of the problems or externalities introduced by AI will be solvable by technology. Just like electricity electrocuted people and uh, uh, the circuit breaker solved the problem, not some regulation. And the internet connected to the PC brought viruses, but the antivirus software solved the problem, not some regulation. So technologies do remain. There are technologies like federated learning might be applied for helping with privacy. Uh, automatic data checking in a compiler kind of way might be useful for reducing bias. Uh, I think there are many, many possibilities, and I would encourage those doing research in AI not just to invent the next training methodology, uh, but rather, uh, but rather think about the practical problems and that may require a researcher to solve. So I would, I would encourage that. And, and I also acknowledge that some problems aren't gonna be solvable by technology. They will require regulation. I do hope governments will remember to balance technology and regulation and not be over-regulating in that would suffocate the technologies. Um, and, and I hope that the governments will also be adaptive, that maybe some regulation will initially be a bit harsh, a bit hard for technologies, but when solutions, te technological solutions are developed, the governments might want to rethink and, and relax at that point. Thank you. So my next question, maybe I go to Tim first. Uh, next, I'm sorry. So uh, do you have any advice for our students here? Like, if we want to take advantage of this opportunity of deep tech uh, entrepreneurship, what should they do at HKUST? Is, how is HKUST a good place for that? Uh, first of all, like, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay, now it's better. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Kaifu for the wonderful, wonderful talk. I think itself is part of our effort trying to bring uh, the mindset, in particularly from the education point of view, I like to point it out that university, <clears throat> even though knowledge transfer is becoming one of our most uh, important uh, area to grow as part of our education function, but our mission is slightly different from commercial side, venture capitalists. I think for us, is to train our students. You have the right mindset in, during your study. You have the entrepreneurship spirit. So we focus a lot of, on entrepreneurship education. A lot of courses, seminars, we even have major uh, on this technology leadership uh, and uh, entrepreneurship master program. We have minors, etc. We have competition. Uh, we have a hackathon. We have a lot of activities for the objectives of educating the students going for this direction, which not only the eventually become the entrepreneur, maybe the spirit, when you're in a workplace, you need to start off from the university. So that's number one. We do a lot of incubation, but the incubation is different from what uh, Kaifu is talking about. Our mindset is seeding. We have a lot of programs. 
We'll give you a small amount of money. We want you to stop the company, join the competition. That spirit, many of them probably will not be able to survive, but not to be afraid of fail, to fail, which is part of entrepreneurship spirit. You're being trained not to fail, to get best grade. Failure is a shame. You have to make change your mindset going through that process. So I think I just want to point out that at university, we are training the students to get ready. When you're in the, uh, after you graduate, or even before you graduate, you will feel that you're ready to enter this career path. And that's our objective. And finally, the last point I want to point out is um, university technology, most of them eventually be very useful. But very often, when you feel you completed writing a paper, it's far from the stage that venture capitalists like Kaifu is ready to pick up. So we, you always heard about this uh, value of death, which means that uh, a lot of company cannot get across that valley to reach the successful stage. But there are actually, there are two value of deaths. One is very well known. Once you stop your company, the first few years, you're going to fail, uh, to lose money until you start generating revenue. But the another even bigger value of deaths is the technology you produce. The technology readiness is not even ready to stop your company. So we in the university, we encourage you to bring that closer to reality and look at the commercial viability, look at the robustness, look at many aspects beyond your research focus. And that requires a lot of training. We, we talk a lot about experiential learning. So with all this, I just providing multiple aspects of what a university can offer to students. At the end, it's for students you need to be brave enough to experience it because many of these activities will not be credit bearing. It's you decided to be educated, you decided to experience it. And I would say at HKUST, we have a full spectrum of activities that you can take advantage of, but it will be your decision because whether you do it or not may not affect your degree, may not affect your GPA, but it will add a lot of value to your education. And such kind of mindset, such kind of experience can carry you a long way. You have a career of 30, 40 years. You heard a lot of successful story. Once one and a half years later, they become successful. Three years become the successful. I would say you want to become one of them, but you may not get it the first time you try it. So you need to start out from when you are in that university. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Kaifu, um, I think we've known each other for 30 years or over 30 years, and uh, you're a veteran in uh, speech recognition, language processing, and I myself the same. We've been in the same field. So I have this bias towards AI. You know, you talked about AI. You talked about different areas you invest in, but I was very interested to see that AI can be applied to almost all the other areas, right? Now, my question, is, again, for the benefit of our students and other faculty, is that if people do not come, for the, you know, they have not been doing AI for 30 years, they have not even been doing AI for 15 years, 10 years, but they do, there are a lot of opportunities. Obviously, we need uh, expert knowledge in other areas, mm -hmm. right? So um, then the question is, how would you have, uh, have you seen cases like uh, AI uh, scientists and, uh, and life scientists or other scientists uh, work together and create successful business? And if so, how can our non-AI uh, specialists uh, at the university um, mm -hmm. you know, come together and create such a business uh, with your venture and with uh, perhaps AI people and so on? Sure. I think much bigger opportunities exist to cross-pollinate than to just build from within one discipline. And, um, and I think AI is an omni-use technology that can be used in everywhere. So it's a great opportunity for you to connect uh, with AI people and learn enough AI tools to apply it to problems in your domain. 
uh, there are many problems that are basically being redefined as we speak. Uh, I mentioned in Silicon Medicine, it was founded by um, Alex Zarenikov, and he is in Hong Kong in the Science Park. He is an AI scientist, but he took an interest in medicine, healthcare, and longevity. And he branched out to learn enough about those areas, and then he's met people in those disciplines and working together, created in silico medicine. So only, only when you have expertise from both areas, AI and uh, drug pharmaceuticals, uh, can you make a drug discovery company using AI. So that's one example. Uh, another example is uh, in the area of AI for finance. Right? For many years, people assume a closed linear form is the best form of estimating stock price. And in fact, a Nobel Prize was given to Black Scholes for that. But we defied that, and we said that can't be. It, there must be a dynamic AI algorithm that can make that prediction more accurately. And the bonus is if you make that model, you make a lot of money because it becomes a trading mechanism to win in inefficiencies in the market. So we actually funded the company, and it's been doing extremely well in that space. So all the existing so-called uh, state-of-the-art or rules are there to be broken when you have AI as a tool uh, and a weapon to change the status quo and to improve the state-of-the-art. Um, so I would encourage all of you to do that. I will also say that AI for science is probably the biggest opportunity facing us, right? We can talk about you know, AI doing, becoming robots, AI showing you better videos, and AI um, making money on trading stocks, but what's more exciting but then changing the fundamentals of science using AI? And, and that's an area that's uh, still not very much covered. It was only uh, four years ago when I spoke at the Breakthrough Prize in the U.S., and there were scientists ready to receive the, like a mini Nobel Award, and I asked, how many of you AI, use AI in your research? Zero hands went up out of 50 people. So I think the, there's a real vacuum, and, uh, and now there's an awareness and a need. And finally, I would say that when you do work with an AI person, be careful that you both need to be committed to each other and each other's technologies because there are fundamental assumptions that may, may be in conflict, right? For example, uh, if an AI person and a medical person get together to work on a project or form a company, the AI person is generally guided by more data is better, and the medical person is every piece of data must be perfect, right? And the AI person is generally thinking statistical. Uh, if we save more lives than we harm, we win. And then the medical person is thinking, oh my God, we must not harm a single life. So there needs to be a re respect for each other and finding a way to work together and find an area where your conflicts in your training and value don't result in a problem for your company. That is, find a way for your interests to be aligned and using ground rules that are proven so you don't have to fight over things so you have a higher chance of success. Well, thank you. Before we go to the questions from the audience, I have one last question for you, Kai Fu. Uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, after going through some personal uh, trials, you gave some talk and you wrote about the importance of having love and uh, heart. So I want to ask you a question on the human, human side of AI. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we are talking about entrepreneurship, but most importantly, the, it's the people who make the business succeed. Right, so it's about the humanity of the entrepreneurs. So, um, and we have seen time and again a lot of uh, business came from the passion of the entrepreneurs. Right, so um, it's not a coldly calculated uh, uh, funding process. I have seen actually our alumni Frank Wong when he founded his company, he just loved building drones at the time. So today, you know, given all these opportunities, it's actually the opportunity is unprecedented, right? There's so many opportunities. So how do you sort of jive this human side of things? How do you reconcile your passion and uh, a person's love for humanity with creating the company and the objectives in life and in business? How do you reconcile the two? Right. 
um, I think that you know, the older I get, the more important that combination feels. And uh, I think it's ideal for, of any age if you can do something you love and it's also a profession and it can lead to a successful business and help you make money. You ideally want to look for that combination. And certainly everything else being equal, we want people who are passionate about the thing that they do. The examples I gave you, um, actually Alex is super passionate about healthcare and longevity. That's what he lives for, so he loves it. And you're, you're, uh, you'll find his energy and passion to be contagious. And, and even in the stock trading company, the CEO is passionate about changing the, the way that um, financial performance is measured and passionate about being the best in the industry he's in. So it doesn't have to be some kind of grandiose, um, world-changing thing. If you really love something, you'll find that you know, you'll be thinking about it uh, when you're you know, taking a shower or eating or sleeping, and you will be naturally more productive. And, and we like people who are, are passionate. Um, and, and that said, there are also people who are great entrepreneurs whose passion may not be exactly in that, um, in that area, but they're incredibly passionate about uh, learn, they're interested in everything, and they're interested in learning, mm -hmm. and that allows them to do extremely well. Uh, a good example in the internet space is Wang Xing, the CEO of Meituan. And you'll see that he's, he's so cur intellectually curious when he's setting up his Black Pearl Award for, to compete against Michelin, he went in deeply to understand what that means. And when everything Meituan builds is built with Wang Xing's personal curiosity and deep dive to understand what makes something work. So I think that passion is needed. It may not be, it may be in the product can change the world in the way you want. It may be that you just love the work that you do. Or it may be that you're just intellectually curious. So whatever you get into, you can become passionate. I think all of this will work. And those make the best entrepreneurs. If you look at the best entrepreneurs in China, in the US, uh, they're all like that. So I would encourage you to be, you know, thinking about what it is that you love to do and not just what's the most um, uh, fashionable or profitable thing to do for the moment. Indeed. Um, thank you so much for these words of wisdom. Maybe now we can take questions from, uh, I don't know, online or audience. Andy, you want to? Well, let's start with the audience. Okay. Uh, do you want to moderate or? Okay. So anybody, question? Uh, thank you for your sharing. It was uh, quite insightful. We have discussion about this uh, gap between technology and the businesses. I want to ask more specific. It's like, uh, how do we bridge the gap between technology and science and business plan? Can you share your view on this? Sure. Uh, I have been almost universally disappointed by the business plans written by academics including their PhD students and from universities. It's not something, I think, unfortunately, there is, um, it's not the same as writing a thesis, okay? And, and it's also not the same as you see in competitions, whether it's um, a competition on, on TV, right? Uh, the Chinese, Ying Zai Zhongguo, or the uh, American, uh, what's it called, the, uh, the, 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 real, the, real, the real life shows of competing. The business plan is not a PowerPoint contest. It's not a demonstration of intellect. It's not a think on, off top of your head what might work. Uh, it needs to be a, driven by a deep understanding of the industry, of the competition, of opportunity. It also needs to be well grounded in understanding that it's not just a technology but what, who's gonna make it into a product? And how is it gonna get made into a product? Why have you picked this market and not, not other markets? When we invest in companies, we want to make sure that every time we talk to a potential entrepreneur we fund, they are wowing us and surprising us and teaching us things and insights, not just about the technology, but about the industry. And when they don't 
they don't, when they don't know more about the industry than we do, we walk away. And, and that's, the, that's a pity because I think, uh, I, I think the problem is the university, as great as it is for learning in academia, does not infuse you with the skill sets of these areas. So I think these competitions that Tim is, is driving, the incubation efforts are very good for practice, but don't believe that the winner of every year's contest in any competition will get VC funding because there is a gap. It's wonderful practice that you get, but in real life, you have to do much more, much more work. So that, that's why um, when we think about how do we help Hong Kong with a couple of great companies, we, we think it might not be working with the student entrepreneurs knocking on our doors and with a business plan. Yes, you, I know you have DJI and, uh, and, and there could be another one, but that, that's probably not the way in which we want to contribute. We want to contribute um, by bringing our know-how with a greater degree of certainty um, and not just being a subject of chance. So our approach in Hong Kong will be uh, talk to every professor about what great technologies there are and use our business know-how to probe and experiment and maybe start with some proof of concepts before we form a business plan. So it's not like I have a great technology, let's write a business plan. It's rather, I have a great technology, I know someone who knows a business and thinks it's relevant and will help us me in doing a business plan. And that business plan will first be, will also be validated by a proof of concept and with some prototypes before it's ever pitched to a VC. So that's the approach I think we would take. So I, I can't really tell you uh, how to write a good business plan because it's, it's almost like if you were, go to, if you were go, to go to, um, um, let's say a great school, let's say Harvard Business School, and someone says, can you teach me how to write an AI PhD thesis? I can't, it's, you gotta do the work, make the mistakes, learn the lessons, learn from the masters. It might take three or five years, but it's not something that, that has a how-to manual. Uh, maybe I can supplement on this aspect. I think uh, it's very well said, but we're in university and we're doing incubation, we do entrepreneurship education. But don't forget that we have strengths, but we must also recognize things that we cannot do. So uh, the gap I mentioned earlier is for students. It's really important to find partners that for things you don't know well, instead of you try to be very well-rounded, understanding everything, which is always good. But on the other hand, we're talking about professional work. So recognizing a university, what we can do, what we cannot do, then partner with other people is a very important recognition. Instead of trying to feel like we can do everything, which is my biggest worry. Because universities are good in science and we're trying to extend our engineering capability. But there are people as practitioner. There are people who understand the industry. And there are uh, innovators. The full spectrum of people. Building a business need all kinds of people. So the message I try to say is strengthen your general knowledge by being very good at what you're good at, what people want you. Then partner with other professionals and build a winning team instead of trying to become mediocre on everything and be the generalist, which may not be the winning strategy. Hello, well, first of all, thank you very much for the very inspiring talk. Um, one thing that I wanted to basically comment or ask your opinion on is that I found that many schools are training data scientists to find the perfect solution to the wrong problems. Like I feel a lot of the time, you know, people get very skilled about thinking about solutions and not about the problems that they are solving. And so in that sense, I think it relates to the previous question that I do find, as I'm a professor here, by the way, so I do find a gap between thinking about people thinking about solutions rather than problems and I was wondering if you see these issues as well 
in industry? And if so, how do your companies address this gap in case you actually see that as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It happens all the time with um, technology startups. Um, you know, a startup based on the real need is like a Meituan or a DD or, a, you know, uh, you know, Alibaba or Tencent, uh, they're not really deep technology companies. They start with the need and they're completely focused on that and they end up doing great in, in filling that need. Um, the, the tendency of technologists is that uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you just said, okay, I've got convolutional networks, neural networks, what should I do? And you think everything you see, you think you use convolutional neural networks. It may not be the best way. It may not be even a good way. And, um, and, and also I find that finding a good application requires um, either strong industrial commercial insight or excellent creativity depends on whether you're trying to solve an existing problem or a future problem. Um, and, and I think, um, to Tim's point, uh, people who have a great technology really should talk to a lot of people who have these two, two skill sets. The people who know about businesses, applications, industries, to see if, hey, I have this technology, can it work in your domain? And then the, the really visionary, uh, imaginative, creative people saying, hey, I have this technology, what's your dream on how this could do? Uh, the former is like, you know, AI. And when we saw the AI progress as business people, we think, wow, in China, what would be the most natural industry? Manufacturing, because China is so big. What problems can you solve? Uh, visual inspection. What other problems? And then the list goes on. So it's, it's um, I, I think the process of looking for possible ways that technology can be applied and possible ways to, to of solving particular problems. Uh, they, there needs to be some um, process that uh, can match and converge. And, um, and, and I think when you have an entrepreneur who has a great technology, who's open-minded, can do the former and then look for a, a match or, or, um, or it could go the other way. Uh, maybe it's by venture building, or um, venture building being someone who wants to build, a, build something but doesn't have the technology and is shopping for the technology. A good example is uh, flagship pioneering, how they are able to understand technologies and say, oh, this mRNA, that could be cool, and, but you need someone who knows pharma. Let's put this guy in charge. So I think both ways uh, work well, and I would say the general advice is don't fall in love with the technology and assume it's the right answer to every problem, um, and, but, but instead uh, be open-minded and, and look around. If it's a great technology, there are probably lots of problems that could be solved, but don't come up with it yourself, talk to other experts, and, uh, and evaluate many before you find one, because if you find the right one, then it's a huge winner. Imagine if you were Larry Page and you discovered this great algorithm called Backrub, right? It has to do with computing links from backwards from HTML. And you say, well, let's build an email product. Well, that would be a failure. And if you think about let's build a, you know, instant message, well, that would be a failure. Search engine is the obvious answer, but if, if that technologist isn't thinking about a search engine, right? Larry was obviously the second of the types of people, which is that he could uh, imagine the future, that what if everything were done differently for search engines with his technology embedded? Then he came up with a winner. The biggest winners are those who can take a technology and really come up with an imaginative but realistic ways of how to disrupt and change a product or an industry, such as Steve Jobs' iPhone, Larry Page's search engine. That's the best kind. The second best kind is like what we do in venture building. We see all these AI technologies and we mix and match them. And we say, okay, large language model, very good for uh, targeted advertising. Okay, great convolutional network, neural network, good for visual inspection and manufacturing. That's uh, 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 not as good as uh, Steve Jobs or Larry Page, but it's, it's pretty good. But if instead all you do is uh, just sit in your room and think about all the things that could be used, then unfortunately you're almost guaranteed to have a suboptimal, if not a completely irrelevant application of your technology.
Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, at the beginning, you kind of briefly mentioned about Web3. I was curious on your thoughts in, let's say, 10, 20 years, um, where would Web3 actually take us? Uh, I think there are two scenarios. Uh, one is it takes us nowhere. Nothing ever works. Another is that a couple of amazing apps come out and make it a great name, make Web3 a great name. <laughs> and the reason is, I see all these passionate people who have uh, strong beliefs, even religious beliefs, and uh, who are altruistic and want good things for the world. Uh, but I have not seen any practical down-to-earth killer app description. Uh, so it's unlikely to lead to anything great by any particular endeavor. But if it has so many passionate and smart people, plus many smart VCs, pretty much all in the United States, who want to, in Silicon Valley, who want to fund them, there's probably a decent chance one of them will develop a great thing. And it may or may not be strictly Web3, but it will be remembered as the killer app for the Web3. So, it's, uh, so it reminds me of the dot-com days, right? So the, the Web craze was just incredible, insane. You were all mostly too young. To, to know, but it was totally insane. There were, you know, pet.com with nothing, losing tons of money worth a billion dollars. This is 1998 money, 1999 money, and web van delivering groceries, losing a ton of money. Um, but, but interestingly, um, what people remember now is that those were crazy ideas that were just too early before their times, that the ideas were good. Eventually, we now do have, you know, pet e-commerce. We do have grocery deliveries to our homes. And certainly, even from that era, we had Google. So that's perhaps the, the good outcome that we may see. But I would uh, probably want to um, uh, reduce the temperature of the heat that I sense, uh, in, in, in certainly in Silicon Valley and maybe elsewhere in the world. Uh, I would say most investors of dot-com technologies in the late 90s lost their shirt. A few made a ton of money on Google, but most lost their shirt. And Web3, I kind of see uh, that being the case as well. Thank you very much for your intelligent talk. I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, my question is that you pointed out um, that some advances can change the paradigm in AI. Some advances outside AI can change the paradigm in AI, like uh, quantum computing can change the whole al algorithm and learning paradigm. So, and this will be something like in 10, 15 years in the future. So the question is how to uh, actually, first of all, be able to see where it is going, and second, how to expand skills and um, get prepared for at that point not to fall off the race. So because I was doing research between deep learning and then in the middle, <laughs> deep learning emerging after that, and there was like a huge jump and um, everything actually changed. So I think it is important to be able to get prepared. And I think this preparation and uh, transformation is something gradual. We cannot jump up. Um, so I would appreciate if you can uh, give your opinion on that. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, a lot of people ask me, how do I make these predictions? Uh, it's 20 years out, what if they're all wrong? And you know, one answer is, in 20 years, I'll be retired and I'll be hiding if it's not wrong, if it's all wrong. But seriously, I, I think predicting the future is not as hard as people think. A lot of it is extrapolation. Look at the two charts I plotted of convolutional neural network and large language model. You can pretty much use that to project the future. So, and the other is analogies. You think, look at what happened with PCs to predict uh, mobile uh, smartphones, what happened on the internet to predict mobile internet, uh, what happened in um, SaaS to predict uh, AI and cloud. And so it's, it's, uh, so we're not really starting from nothing to make predictions, but either using analogies or uh, extrapolations. So what's the analogy and extrapolation for quantum computing? Well, um, the experts have demonstrated and shown and predicted 
the likely size of the quantum computers, they think their institutions and the field can produce. Now, I, I realize they're not building it, developing it based on hard science, but kind of doing extrapolations, but they're more expert than, than I. So the 10 to 15 years is kind of an industry consensus, mostly relying on the super experts from IBM and Google. I, I read a lot about what they say because I don't have the deep skill set to make that prediction. Um, so assuming it's 10, 10 to 15 years, we probably can expect with a high degree of likelihood that the discontinuity will occur, just like deep learning, right? The moment deep learning arrived, most people who did anything in AI had to relearn it and had to redo everything, possibly the same case with quantum. So um, with deep learning, it, it, it also depends. So who would have recognized deep learning earlier? Well, those who were open-minded and read more papers, including those from maybe not so famous people, um, you know, I think for a while the connectionist people were not among the highest rate of getting papers accepted. So being open-minded, look at the papers, and look for discontinuity and surprising results in those papers. That would be one hint in general. Uh, with, with quantum, actually, you can watch how fast the quantum computers are becoming, and you can begin to program a you know, four-bit, eight-bit, eight, four, eight-qubit quantum computer is not very useful. There are also simulations of quantum computers that run on conventional computers. So those are things you can start to do. Probably they'll be too painful right now for you to do because they're, the small ones are just too much of toy. The large ones, the simulations are way too slow. So watch for a point of some interesting toy problems that you can start to program. Probably in the next three to five years, you can start to do that. And then, and then um, um, it can be more gradual as opposed to something that surprises you and causes you to be um, shocked and uh, not becoming productive after that. I would, I would like to uh, add something to that. I think when you are working on some uh, technology in AI today, machine learning, it is, you know, the lesson we have learned that is that uh, machine learning paradigm changes every 20 years it changed um, profoundly. So you ask yourself, what is the problem you're solving in your thesis? Is it a problem that's tied to the current existing platform? Is it uh, you know, another variation of the transformer or something like that? You, you want to have something that you can build in the future, right? You, 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 to be a visionary, you have to say, what is the big problem we need to solve today? What is this problem we still need to solve? And uh, we still, uh, and in the future, when we have better technology, then it can be uh, completely solved. So the people who were working on neural network 30-some um, years ago, they couldn't make it work as well as the existing state of the art, like the HMMs and so on. They insisted because they had the vision that one day, when the computing power is there, when there's more data, it's going to work really well. So, I mean, it's, it's difficult to be such a visionary, right? But ask yourself, you know, what you're doing today, is it just uh, incremental? Is it too dependent on the current, current, uh, uh, current platform, or, or is it more futuristic? Again, that's, that's about research. That's not about entrepreneurship. Um, so entrepreneurship, the challenge is going from technology to products, right? Core technology to products. Right. Okay, so. I think we have uh, pretty much exhausted our time. Uh, we've got just done, which has been, been very interesting. So um, if there's anything you'd like to say to wrap up. Um, Kai Fu, you want to wrap up? <laughs> Well, it's the, sure, it's the most exciting times, and I think the questions indicate that people are very excited about all the things happening. And I think Hong Kong is a great place to be. I sense a lot more energy on this trip, and I'll be back frequently and hope to uh, meet with you and maybe even fund some of your startups. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Special thanks to Kai Fu, Tim, and Pascal for the interesting conversation. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, great. Thanks very much.